at that particular point in time, I, I, I just, I wanted to be in a relationship. I wanted something that had the potential to go somewhere, but that there was somebody who wanted to really give it a shot. If it didn't work out, I, I understand. You are and were then, you had this, you're such a decent human being. There's not a um, deliberately mean or malicious bone in your body. You mean well with everything you do. Take a girl and a guy, and they fall madly in love and form a family. Sprinkle in some counseling degrees and a doctorate, a dream of transforming relationships as we know it. And 20 years later, we give you power couple Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. And this is their podcast, Couples Synergy. Welcome back to another episode of Couples Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean. I'm Dr. Ray. And I'm Jean, and this is our podcast about love, marriage, and relationships. Check us out online at couplesynergy.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast or send us any suggestions on topics you'd like to hear more about. And now on to Couple Synergy, an in-depth look at love, marriage, and relationships where we bring you your experiences with working with thousands of couples for over 15 years. You know, every day we get to hear about intimate details, about a couple celebrations, disappointments, and everyday challenges. We've often wished these stories were shared so that we can learn that we are more similar than different. And so we created not only an avenue where you can hear about people's intimate lives, but an atmosphere where people come over to our home pub, pour a drink, and share their stories. People like today's guest, Jerry and Linda, how are you? Great. Hi, guys. Thanks very much for coming on our show and on the podcast and agreeing to tell your story. You're welcome. And, you know, before we get to that, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves? How old are you and what do you guys do for a living? How long have you been together? Well, I'm Linda and I am, <laughs> I, I, I never say it out loud, so I have to actually remember. <laughs> I'm 68 and um, I... I'm not working from, you know, every day outside of the house, but I'm still managing my husband's practice, his orthodontic practice, a little bit. And, um, but I'm starting to trust the manager there to let her do more. So it's good. I am a substitute yoga teacher. So I'll do that occasionally. And I'm a Reiki master teacher, which I just do on my for myself for the most part. I haven't really done too many attunements recently. And then I also am very into these days ceramics and pottery. And so pretty much that's where my life is. I was at Harper at the beginning of this and driving up here is a little bit of a distance um, little haul, but it's okay. <laughs> it's great. I love, I love it. I love what I do. And um, I feel kind of a little bit guilty being away from the house so much that, I mean, I would be away truly 40 hours a week if there were open studio time of 40 hours. So it's um, wonderful, though. I am just so feel like this thing in my head is turned on in creativity. And being a trained attorney, there's a little creativity that's used, but not very much. Mm -hmm. And so it's really been great just to open all that up. That's wonderful. Yeah. How about you, Derek? Well, as Linda said, I'm, I'm an orthodontist. I'm 60. Five, five, right? <laughs> See your moment there. Actually, I'll be 66 in a, in a few weeks. And um, yeah, I, I was just saying to Ray before we came on air that I, I, I love what I do. And um, I actually think I'm doing the best work I've ever done in my life, which is great to be able to say. And uh, I'm very grateful for my practice, for the patients who come in and uh, the trust that they put in me to take care of their treasure, which is their children or their family. It's an exciting time in our profession in terms of what's going on with technology. I continue, I love learning. And if, if people would pay me to go to school, I'd be at school all the time. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I've put a lot of time in the last few years into continuing education. And uh, it's just really exciting what we're seeing happening in, in, in our orthodontic profession. So that's uh, that's kind of, you know, my, my major work. I'm also a musician, and that's a major avocation for me. I love all kinds of music. I uh, have a particularly deep love of jazz, and uh, I play a bunch of different instruments. I have a regular church gig every weekend, and that's a wonderful thing. I have some wonderful people that I, that I play with every weekend who are really great friends. So... Yeah, it's pretty much what I do. <laughs> it's really awesome to see that you guys both have things you're very passionate about, which I think doesn't happen until you get a little bit older in life. You know, yeah. you're in the grind of it earlier than that. Mm -hmm. Can you guys tell us the story of how you met? Sure. 
<laughs> well, throw in anything you want if I forget. <laughs> so we were both involved in, I guess it would be considered a personal effectiveness seminars. And we, so we were participating in our own, going our own path in our, in, in doing this work and there's seminars that are offered. And so when Jerry began doing the seminar route, I kind of noticed him. I was helping actually produce them at that point. And so we met formally ish at a party that was a fundraiser for one of the seminars they they put on it's an outdoor it was an act, outdoor week long activity and so at this party in order to raise the funds they decided to have an auction not a silent one but a you know a live auction <clears throat> people were auctioning things off like full body massages wine collections things that really people wanted and mm -hmm. then Jerry somebody oh somebody you know an actress even au auctioned off a day with herself <laughs> at the behest of all the guys in the group. And so somebody convinced Jerry to auction off an orthodontic evaluation. So we're at this party. It's 1 a.m. Everybody's just in like an artist loft. There's been wine and drinks flowing freely. People are dancing. It's a crazy, great, giant party. And then he says he's got an orthodontic evaluation and the place goes dead. <laughs> a screeching halt. <laughs> I mean, really, it was just the perfect end. I mean, it just, it was so funny. You know, it was like somebody threw a bucket of water in, on top of everything. So I pull, I, I mean, he, he hadn't, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, if, if he was interested in me, he would have let me know by now. And, you know, but then I saw him and he was standing there and all the vulnerability I'm going to cry. All the vulnerability just came out. And he's standing there. Nobody's bidding on this ridiculous <laughs> so orthodontic. Value. <laughs> I mean, it included in the impressions and x-rays, you know. And so I look at my checkbook. It's like balance is zero. And I thought, how long will it take him to cash this check? You know, so I bid and I won. So for 50 bucks, I got my orthodontic evaluation. And he gave me a lift home. As it turns out, I didn't have a ride home. So that was very convenient. So that was the beginning. And we actually, we probably talked till 3 a.m., read poetry. And that, that night, that night, yep, he came home, gave me a lift home. We read Rilke poetry. We, he went home and we started going out. Three weeks later, we were in, we had we decided to have a committed relationship. Three I mean, weeks later. Three weeks. Because wow. how old were you guys? Well, that's the thing is, you know, we both we were big people. We had both been through one marriage each. Okay. And so I was probably 37. No, I think so. 37, 38. He was a baby, 34, <laughs> 35. And so we knew that you know, I had the biological click tick, uh, clock ticking. I mean, it was, it, we knew it was time. And that's one of the things with this seminar too, is, you know, you just kind of learn if you see something you want, just, just do it, just go for it. So we just said, okay, we had an agreement. We're going to be in a committed relationship. And we, we did that. So that was about 11 months later, we got married. It was great. It worked wonderfully. He proposed, it was terrific. We got married. And then nine months later, we had our only child. So it was wonderful. It was perfect. Wow. That's like a whirlwind. Was, it was, and it was, but it wasn't, you know? Yeah. It was and it wasn't. But we didn't know. I mean, when you get into marriage, when you jump in, and I guess it's a jump, but we were both adults and we'd both been through marriages and relationships a lot. Jerry had moved from another country. We we were pretty much adults, but you still don't know. It's still a surprise who you're married to, no matter if you're 24 or 34. I mean, I had... I had our daughter when I was 39. So to to get to know someone while you're nursing, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an right. experience, you know, it really yeah. is. But the same process goes. So anyway, that's how we met. And that's how that's the next stage and probably answered about six more questions. But that's the story <laughs> that's okay. of it. We'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> hey, Jerry, do you have a, a different perspective of that night? And for the listeners out there, you're probably uh, picking up on an accent from Jerry here. And you know, Linda did mention that he does come from another country. And what country is that? I'm from Ireland. I'm yeah. from Dublin, Ireland. Yeah. There we go. So, um, well, just since you, you brought that up, yeah, I came over here to study to study orthodontia. I had, as Linda mentioned, I had been married before, and uh, we didn't have any children. Both of my ex-wife and I, we got married very, very young. I think I was 23, and she was 
2020, I think. And um, it's funny the way things work out. We're really, really good friends now, I would say. I mean, we don't hang out or anything, but I would say an enormous amount of healing has taken place over the years and we would care about each other. And uh, I wish her well in every happiness and I know she would feel the same. And she's met and spent time with Linda and Brenna. And so Does she live very, here? Is she, she lives in, in Chicago. Okay. Yeah, she's, she, is a, she is an Irish-American and um yeah and so that's that's kind of that and, and linda and i will be it'll be we're married 30 years and it'll be 31 in november so you know i'm I, one of the things i certainly would say is well i certainly don't recommend divorce there is life after it there's no question <laughs> yeah. but that, that probably the most painful thing i ever went through but there is there is life on the other side it's very hard to hear that when you're in the middle of it but it certainly is mm -hmm. true in terms of the night, yeah, everything she said is pretty much accurate. I was I was dying up there. She 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 rescued me. So and and it's true. We went back and we shared poetry, and um, it was a, a lovely a lovely night. And it was the beginning of, of a relationship. And yeah, I mean, um, we did. I I know. I kind of said, look, I want to be in a committed relationship. Are you up for this? Because it's okay if you're not, but I need to know now. So and you so, officially asked her. Oh yeah, and that was the three yeah. week mark. Oh, that's right. Yeah, tell that part. That's I good. Don't what to say about it. <laughs> well, about a week into the dating, he said, I want to be in a committed relationship. And I was I was not in a committed relationship at that point. You know, I was enjoying myself. I finally was kind of, I don't know how many years after my divorce, it was a short marriage. I, I, I was having a great time, you know, and he wanted me to basically <laughs> stop with that. And just so he did say that. And so maybe it was two weeks. And I said, can I let you know, like next month? And he said, no, that's not enough. That's no, no. And so he said, you have a week. <laughs> he gave a deadline. I got a deadline. Oh, yeah. This is not like do, me, do you by know the why way. You did that? Why did you do that? To be honest with you, I wasn't interested in messing around. Okay. I, I wanted a serious relationship. And um, yeah, that's that's really why I said it. It's like at that particular point in time, I, I, I just, I wanted to be in a relationship. I wanted something that had the potential to go somewhere, but that there was somebody who wanted to really give it a shot. If it didn't work out, I, I understand. But I, I, so you're I saying didn't. there's men out there that actually want to be in a committed relationship in their 30s? <laughs> I, I know. I'm, I thinking, I'm thinking the same thing. Right? Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's Just, great. He yeah. would be a dream on one of those dating yeah, sites, right? Absolutely. Match.com. And, and I think a lot of people that are at that stage of life, they, they think men don't look for that. So yeah. it's really great that you're yeah. letting them know that there are real guys out there that want that. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah, so he gave us a gave me a deadline, and um, she started to cry. I we met at a restaurant, <laughs> and I tears of joy. I imagine no, no, I burst into tears as the waitress came up to take our order, and she just did this U turn and zipped away. <laughs> and I'm just crying, and I just said, "Yes, I'll be in an acrylic." You'd think that someone had died, so it was. What were you because, feeling? Well, that's I was feeling a loss of that really fun person. I. You know, I was having a great time. Independence or no, 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 not at all. I mean, no, it was m me fully choosing. Uh -huh. But I had to, to if you know, a choice means you don't pick other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rarely, when you pick something, you get everything. You get to have, you know, you can't have everybody. You can't date six guys and have a committed relationship or whatever. I wasn't dating six guys. <laughs> well, I think you can but, in yeah. California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're talking about that in the legislature here in Illinois. But um, so it was just farewell to who I had been. And so it was kind of like right there, being with it, leaving it, walking away from it and walking into Jerry's life. So. Yeah. So I got over that. I mean, I stopped crying. And he said, if this is that, if you really don't want to do this, it's okay. And I just said, no, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. So um, we're, we were at both working, volunteering to help with these seminars the next night. And I was eating something before and he was coming back from work or something and coming in. And so I'm eating something and I have leftovers. And normally I would have just like left them or maybe packed them up, but I packed them up for him. Because I thought, wow, wait, I should bring him something to eat now. I mean, I'm like immediately switched on this caretaking world. It was <laughs> the oddest thing. Luckily, wow. he didn't mind it. <laughs> you know, luckily, but he said, you probably, you know, it was, it, it was just, we shifted that quickly into that relationship. Mm -hmm. What was going on in both of your lives before you met? How long had you been divorced? Were you dating? Were you kind of doing your own thing? 
Why don't you start? No, you, you start. Your turn. Okay. The divorce was probably the most, if I said, one of the most painful things I'd ever yeah. gone through in my life because I was here. I didn't have any family. I had no family at all, as you know, and I was in a work situation that was really miserable. And so I didn't, at that particular time, it sounds like a sob story, but I really didn't have much support. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was, I was really kind of adrift, or I had a sense that I was adrift. I was able to make some decent money. You know, I had a job, but I got to a point where in that job, I was miserable. And I had to say to the guy who was paying me very well at the time, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. We're either going to hate each other or one of us is going to have a heart attack before we're 40. So I had to make a decision and I decided to leave and went and worked with a, a friend of mine who had been a couple of years uh, ahead of me in, in, in orthodontics, who a wonderful woman and uh, her husband. And uh, they, they were just dear friends. And um, so I was working with them. It was during that time I began to try and put my life back together and mm -hmm. heard about this, uh, this forum thing. And that's how I kind of. And how many just, years was that after the divorce? I'm just trying to think, you know, I was still at the, when I got involved before I met Linda, I think I had just, just gotten divorced. Okay. And you hadn't dated. I uh, no, I dated a couple of times. Okay. Yeah, I had done some dating, not, not a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There had been a young woman at the practice where I was and we dated for a while. And uh, there were, there were a couple of other just, you know, casual, non-committed. They didn't take you up on your offer of that well, orthodontic no, I, 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 evaluation. I wasn't offering. <laughs> I'm oh, so offering. You weren't offering. No. So Something weren't different. you separated for a while between? Yes. Between. That's, yeah. So it wasn't like boom, divorce. No, not at all. No, no. That was, I mean, I grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. So that was another whole layer to the, to the, the, um, you know, the divorce and the separation thing that was very hard. Was that okay. decision mutual or did she decide or you, or you um, decide? In fairness, I mean, she was the one who left, but I think uh, I knew. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I look, go back on it, I knew that the, it wasn't going to work in the first place. And you I hear went that. into it. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a sad kind of thing. But, I, you know, I was infatuated with her at the time. and uh, But I knew that this was not a fit. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, but but even in in the face of that, we had some good years, you know. Mm -hmm. We were married six years, and uh, it's not by any means all bad. That's why you look back and then say, you know what, there was a richness there too, and it's uh, it's the way it, it was a stepping stone for for what is next, and mm -hmm. there was some growing up, and the pain of having to go through a, a huge loss like that is the kind of thing that I think uh, that that uh, is a real offering if you want yeah. in one's life. And so I'm grateful for it. I don't wish the pain on anyone, mm -hmm. but I think that what is available on the other side of that is life changing. It's the like, growth I, and the I'm lessons. so, yes, exactly. Yeah. Jane. I am so grateful for mm -hmm. that, for, for the pain because I have to get back and, and look at my life and see, you know, who am I mm -hmm. and why am I doing certain things a certain way? And, um, and it was, it was, so I have to say that uh, doing this, this landmark forum, and by the way, we're not involved in any way with this, and this is not any kind of a promotion for it, I think, but uh, I am deeply grateful for that at that mm -hmm. particular time for the couple of years or whatever that we, four or five years that we were involved with it, it really changed my life. Mm -hmm. I woke up, it's like I was walking dead before that, and then suddenly I woke up mm -hmm. and there was a possibility of being alive, of I can't even begin. It's it just literally like being asleep and suddenly waking up and, oh, my God, there's all this life out here. It yeah. can, be, can be experienced in so many ways as these people that I know nothing about. Yeah. Because it's like, OK, this is a little vulnerable, but it's kind of if I had been in relationship with people before, I, I'd be kind of looking at you, Jean, now wondering what you're thinking about me mm -hmm. rather than. And suddenly there was this thing that this veil was that, oh, my God, there's a human being over there. Yeah. And I don't know the first thing about her. And so there was this total shift from being completely wrapped up in my own self mm -hmm. or worried about how I'm coming across to to realize hey, there's there's a world out there that I don't know anything about that's exciting. Yeah. There are people there. Yeah. There's <laughs> life. There's music, there's love, there's food. It's interesting that you say that because I, I think that, especially for myself, if I'm inside too much, yeah, it's not good in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is in that, you know, I was listening to Tony Robbins and he was saying that when you're in a place of helping, yeah. you're in a place of abundance because yes. you have something to offer. Yeah. 
But when you're not, you're in that place of lack because you want something. Yeah. And you don't have it. Yeah, exactly. And, and it feels horrible. It really yeah. does. Can I just, uh, you, I was saying this to Linda the other day because we were talking about work. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have said to her, you know what? I'm really glad I still go to work because it's not a good place. Sometimes if I'm in the, in the basement, I'm working on my music and I have my saxophone out and I'm running through exercises and scales and you're trying to get the muscle memory thing going, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, there's a kind of a, a mindlessness about it, but then the mind starts going on and saying, oh my God, this is not kind of, it's good to go to work. There's people out there. <laughs> so It's really true. Yeah. Yeah. And what was happening for you before you guys met? Before we met, I was um, practicing law. I had gotten through, well, let's see, I had finished a master's in Ann Arbor when I divorced, moved to Chicago for a job. And your divorce was much oh, earlier. Much earlier. I So I divorced at 26. So I married, I met Jerry when I was 37 or 38. Was 38. your divorce also a pivotal time of your life? Absolutely. It was very similar to what Jerry's describing. It was like a loss. It was, it's, it's like you have, the person has died no matter. I mean, I'm the one that left the relationship and it's still like a death. Do it's you remember so, why you chose that? He was a little bit older than I was. And there was a feeling that I was looking for a father figure when I married him. Mm -hmm. And there was just this one day it dawned on me that that's really what was going on. And so it began, you know, it's hard to even describe. It was a very amicable divorce, but it's not never, it's never pleasant. So he moved to DC and I moved to Chicago and we divorced. We used the same, I mean, it was, it was very easy and quick, but absolutely difficult, terribly difficult there. I, he was still like my best friend. So I would call him every day. He's at work in DC. I'm work. He'd say, and finally, he said, you know, you really probably, we, we shouldn't probably talk every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, right. Yeah, right. We're not married anymore. Yeah. Okay, got it. And you mentioned it was a shorter marriage. It was right? only three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And so it, there, there was that, but there was putting it together. And for me, it was putting myself back together. It wasn't, he was very well adjusted. I was not. I was not all there when I married him. I wasn't all there for a lot of years. I was in Chicago. And so I needed to do what I could to try to put together the person that I am. And that took a while. The forum really, really did help. But still, I was still in that process when we married and continue is continues today. You know, we're still putting ourselves Absolutely. finding who we are, but I, I, well, you mentioned Tony Robbins and I think Tony Robbins for us that we have done a lot of the Tony Robbins work mm -hmm. a lot together and separately. And I think that's really where we both have come to become who we are. Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins is, you know, his stuff is great. Yeah. You know, it's led, led us, led me to really taking some responsibility for, the person that I am. So now what would you guys say you were attracted to or what did you fall in love with about the other person? You know, that's a, I, I thought this might come up or something <laughs> around this. And I actually thought about it quite a bit because wow. I, I, you prepped yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, only in the sense that, um, I, I think it has changed an awful lot over the years, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and, way, way, way deeper now than it was 30, 34 years ago or whatever. I mean, I don't mean it's straight. I thought she was beautiful. Obviously, I was attracted to her. But, and this still says that she's really smart. <laughs> and um, she's, I don't, she's really funny. She's incredible sense of humor. And she's this great laugh that pretty much lights up a room and uh, just gets everybody laughing. And she's really compassionate and, um, and I just really enjoyed talking to her. I, I mean, I still do. And uh, I think the those were those qual qualities were always there in, an, in in perhaps a slightly more embryonic way because she was still figuring that stuff out for herself. But I think it was the, those things were all there. There there are many other nuanced things for it, but I think that's a good start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> you did good. You did good. Okay. You did good. <laughs> what made me fall in love with you? You, you, and you still have this quality. I didn't do the homework, apparently, but 
Um, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. You are and were then. You had this. You're such a decent, decent human being. There's not a um, deliberately mean or malicious bone in your body. You mean well with everything you do. Your intention is pure. He's the guy. I keep, I always tell him he should have been a priest. He should have really gone to the <laughs> seminary. He's just too good for one person. I lucked out. An Irish Catholic priest. Exactly. <laughs> There's not There's no enough stereotype of those. There. <laughs> so not enough of those. But I mean, I, I really, he, the, he, the church did not grab him. You know, they should have. Thank God. I know. I know. I mean, we all have our but I, I did luck out. It was sheer luck and the fact that I saw that there was something that he he was that I could trust completely. And I always had promised myself I would never get into a serious relationship unless it was with somebody who was a musician as well, yeah. which <laughs> I didn't know. I did, when we did this three weeks, yes, I'll be in a committed. I did not realize he had mentioned he played guitar occasionally, but everybody plays guitar occasionally. So that was nothing. So then I go, I hadn't even seen his apartment. We won't go there, but I hadn't even seen his apartment. <laughs> and there in the corner, he's got a piano, upright piano. And he starts, or no, we well, had that too, but he had a keyboard. So he starts to play on this keyboard. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, I did it and didn't even realize it. This is, he's really got Snagged it all. Snagged a musician. <laughs> Snagged a, No, but he, and he's just, just plays from the heart. He plays when he plays. He is music. So that was kind of cool too. That was definitely a, oh, but then when we, we, here's what really decided it. We ordered pizza and we both said, do you like anchovies? Because we really, I need anchovies. And he said, I do too. So we knew. <laughs> there's only like three people that eat anchovies in the world. And we knew that we had to stay together. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, that's what, what made me fall in love with you is your decency and your kindness and your gentleness. But let me give you the other side of this. Though. Okay. See, she has this really good friend, Linda, also known mm -hmm. called Linda Stevens. With their kind of, they, <laughs> That's they not in my head. It's a real Linda. <laughs> 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 and, and they talk, you know what? She said, yeah, he needs a lot of work, though. <laughs> oh, we agree. Right? We totally agree. There, he is really just tabla rasa. Yeah, we know, need I it mean, to just work. Yeah, we need a lot of work. <laughs> this one needs a lot of work. How is it coming? <laughs> Yeah, Some days better than others. <laughs> yeah, right. did, did you guys live together before you got married? We did. How would you make that decision? It was economic. Well, actually, why did you keep, he kept, you know, the, the same sp spontaneity of, I need to be in a committed relationship. Just let me know if you don't want to do that. So he goes, let's, let's move in. Every time I talked about, so, I actually think he wanted a housekeeper. because I, 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 was, I, I like would go on this rant about how I hated a dirty bathroom. And he goes, let's move in together. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what's the motivation here? But he would say that, you know, every, I don't know, because this is a three-week period. No, it was after that. Let's move in. And I, and I actually just said, you know when we're ready maybe we'll see but then we looked we were in a committed relationship at that point and the economics were so amazing we just said you know it, this is where we're going so he actually proposed approximately around the time we moved in together because so that's about nine months into the relationship no that was no that was um oh boy you okay we got together january he proposed in may we're married in november okay okay so tell us about the proposal <laughs> on that one <laughs> it wasn't one of those no, ones this is not this is not this is not it was good go god i can't remember, no. I can't yeah. remember. oh yes you did can. you have a ring no, no. okay no no it was a great two days <laughs> no go ahead i jerry i'm completely stuck. all right so we were in a rest so we're going to be in a seminar together again you know with with respect to the landmark forum we're in a restaurant and where there's a lot of the people in this restaurant it's, it's the dinner hour just before this thing starts and so we pretty much in this little it was like takeout deli restaurant thing we knew everybody in there because they're all in there getting their food going upstairs doing that so we're sitting in there next to each other in the deli and somehow he finally he says something like 
he finally asked me to marry him. Just just like, you know, I think I'm going to have a sub with lobster <laughs> on it. And then let's get married. Let's get married. <laughs> <laughs> or something. It was pretty. Would you like my was, dill pickle? It was, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I bring if you read the dill. <laughs> um, sweet pickle, baby. <laughs> um, no, I, it was, it, it was, um, I was feeling like he better start thinking about proposing. That was my mm. feeling. And he was probably talking about wanting to move in together. And I was probably, I think I was saying something like, I need to have a commitment before I do that again. I'm not going to live with anybody else mm -hmm. ever again. I need to have that. So he said, okay, will you marry me? And I said, yes. Then my other friend, my, my friend who's actually the maid of honor, who was a matron of honor. Is this the other the Linda? Wedding. No, it was a different, <laughs> the matron of honor. Another Her woman. name is Jean, too, by the way. <laughs> so she, she sits down, and I turn to her and said, guess what? Jerry just proposed. We're getting married. And oh <laughs> she stands up and says, everybody, guess what? And Jerry says to her, and I should have just taken this. He said, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. <laughs> 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 Why did you say that? <laughs> well, do you remember what, what you were thinking? Was I it do. that spontaneous? Were you, or were you sort of planning it? No, it was. It was very spontaneous. Okay, but it was. It was in the year, but it was spontaneous. <laughs> I'm even thinking, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> no. Maybe the, the gravity of the situation hadn't really hit me at that time. So I'll kill you, though. I mean, this is not Jerry. I'll kill you. Why did you I mean, not want her to, to tell? I actually have to think about that a little okay. bit. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have a quick answer for that or a quick, but maybe I was afraid. The vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think I was afraid of the gravity of the of mm -hmm. the the decision that I'd made, and and the fact that she'd accept that she'd accepted made. that we had made, yeah, and that <laughs> she'd accepted that, and um, yeah, and I think I was a little afraid at, at this up until this point. This was mm -hmm. just between the two of us, right? You know, and now somebody that that was a good good a good friend and everything, but was going to announce this on the spot to the world. And I wasn't really ready for mm -hmm. it at that particular time. I think that's probably the most honest yeah. answer that I could give. You hadn't processed it yet. I exactly right. exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. I hadn't really had a time, and I really hadn't <clears throat> had a chance for Linda and I to celebrate that moment or to mm -hmm. to um, what, would, what would be the word um, solidify mm -hmm. this commitment between the two of us before it could be put out there. So it was yeah. still very tender. Mm -hmm. Sure. And 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 uh, and that's so I think that's probably what it was. Well, next time you'll do it more in private. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I really to did not totally. I mean, so we were we were on fast track, mm -hmm. and so when he said that, it was so out of character. I just turned to him and said, "Jer," and he just, "Oh yeah, yeah, right, good, so it's fine." And then he just he kind of like went back into himself and realized it. She proceeded to announce it. She announced it. She announced it. Oh, yeah. It was like all over. <laughs> had you guys met each other's families at this point? Nope. Oh, gosh, no. His mom, he only had a mom and a sister at Cousins, but I don't even know where. where. Was your sister in Canada at the time? No, I think she was in Australia. Oh, no. No, she wasn't. Africa. That's right. Yep. Okay. So, anyway, she was not here. And mom was in, she had had a stroke. And so uh, she could understand things, but she couldn't really talk much. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she hadn't been over. And mm -hmm. I had probably had exchanged four words with her because all she could say is gorgeous and hello and bye. And that was about it. What about your side of the family? Well, my family all lives in Florida. Okay. And so he hadn't met them either. Now, shortly thereafter, we began to meet each other's people. But I didn't meet his mom till the week we got married. And I did not meet his sister Till after, yeah, I guess we had a child, a toddler. Oh, wow. Because she was in South, she was in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. So she didn't make the wedding. Oh, gosh, no. no. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah. The wedding was very simple. It was in my dad's, my, my mom and dad's backyard. And um, it was, that was, it was lovely. That really it was, lovely. was lovely. Did you guys plan it together? Yeah, we did. Such as it was, you yeah, know, it was. very un. You it know, was unpretentious, very simple. Yeah. It was couple, lovely. Couple couples that were friends of ours came down for it, including the matron of honor and her now husband, who was his best man. And uh, then we had 
at his condo in Lincoln Park, we had a reception the following week. So when we got back, there was a reception. For our friends here mm -hmm. in Chicago. And it turned out, so if you want to go back and look up <laughs> in the morgue at, in the Tribune, there's an article about our story. <laughs> they had had a slow news day and they called the caterer and said, hey, you know of anything interesting going on? And the caterer filled them in. So I, you know, they called and I told them the story. And so it's in there. And women that I met in the following, like, 10 years said, I remember reading that story. I was like, they all wanted to find, where can I find a guy and at an what auction? Was it in? The Trib. Okay. <laughs> in, oh, the, wow. in the, you know, like the society, yeah. you know, like uh -huh. the social pages. So this is the second interview about your relationship. Correct to right? me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll tell anybody at any time. <laughs> we we kind of have a theory that as a wedding goes, so does a marriage. Would mm -hmm. you guys say that's true? The way you planned it, the way you <laughs> were involved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because it was just, you know, it was just the family, you know, my parents got a couple of trays of sandwiches and, you know, uh, yeah, it was kind of, like, well, it was great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think, I think it was, I suppose so a little chaotic was, sometimes yeah. and, you know, full of surprise. There were some surprise surprises. I don't think I had ever seen my father. So when my parents moved to Florida, they kind of took on new persona because they had raised five kids and they were very serious about it in Ohio and now they're in Florida. And I think it was the first time I ever saw my father dancing. Mm. And so it was like all these surprises kept unfolding as to who the heck my family was. And so I think that was, I, I think that is, I mean, I, I guess you could describe it, you know, if mm -hmm. I used about 10 adjectives, surprise, chaos, fun, friends, Love, I think that's that's a good description. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree with that. You mentioned your family. What? Um, how would you guys say your marriage is similar or different to your parents' relationships? I don't know yours. You don't know mine. So go ahead. Wow. Well, my father was about, I think, twenty five years older than my mother. Mm. Twenty five. So, wow. Yeah, I think he was twenty twenty four twenty five years older, and he died when I was thirteen. So at that point, he was 64, so actually a year younger than I am right now. And um, so um, obviously that's very different right, from, from, right. from our relationship. Um, I, you know, you're living in a different time and a different, you know, different circumstances. For me, different country too, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I would also say that um, just my assessment, I think that, that Linda and I, have a much better relationship than my parents did. You know, we talk more, we work our stuff out. And, you know, we we still share the same bed. <laughs> my yeah. parents didn't at a certain point. You know, and um, wait, what? I didn't my, know my, that. Yeah, at a certain point, I don't. I, I I did not know that. There you go. No. Oh. So your mother was twenty five when she had you, and your dad was fifty. Yeah, just about. Oh, wow. It might have been, you know, she might have been twenty six. He might have been forty nine. But it's in that very close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because. Yeah, that would be right. He would have been fifty at least when he had me. What was is it, was there a reason they gave for that? No, I mean, uh, my sister and I have kind of thought about that. There was a lot of secrecy mm -hmm. and a lot of certainly plenty of dysfunction yeah. in the family. And I think that um, all I know is that at a certain point, my mom moved out of that room down to another room. Mm -hmm. And um, as I think back, something something happened. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what that was. And of course it was never shared. So, mm -hmm. so that, that there's a, some, you know, some sadness about that. For, at least, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, think about it much, but as, just as I reflect on it, I think that's, uh, I think that's sad, mm -hmm. you know, that people can be intimate, you know, through, through the course of their marriage, you know? Yeah. How old were you when, when that happened? Mm -hmm. Hard to say, Lynn, I think maybe 10, you know, okay. I mean, I, I, but I'm, I'm just making that up. It could have been nine or, but, but I'd say, let's say 10, 10 ish. And you notice like a marked difference in the home where at one point they were sleeping together and then at some point they weren't. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I, things are when I was very little, these memories, as you mm -hmm. kind of just talking about it, I remember when Colette, my sister and I were very little and dad would work late at night. And, um, you know, we lived in a two story house and there was a, you know, a landing and stuff like that. And, I remember hearing dad come home sometimes at night and she would come up and meet him in the hall. She might have been down in the kitchen and I'd hear them kind of fooling around and giggling, you know, mm -hmm. in the in the hall and he'd be kissing her and 
stuff and stuff like that. And you know, we we feel little kids looking over the Prime Minister. <laughs> you know, and there was a you know there was a sweetness about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then you know obviously there was some sense that something had happened. So I yeah. Don't know. Well, that's the other thing that made me fall in love with him is he's such a romantic. He is very much this a romantic. This is true. I am. <laughs> yeah, he I, is. I have a few good moves. Not a bad I forgot. Thing. I forgot. <laughs> I, how could I forget that important part? He is very much a romantic. Sent me flowers constantly to the point my boss said, what does he own part of it? <laughs> a florist. <laughs> part of it. Uh, yeah, Quastoffs or whatever it was. It. So, so huh. about your parents' relationship. Well, they actually were slept in separate beds, too, but she worked the night shift as a nurse. And so ostensibly the reasoning was she came, I mean, she had her own, she had terrible hours. You know, she'd get mm. in at whatever time, either she worked evening shift or night shift. And my dad was an early riser. So I don't think anything broke or anything. I just think that they got real busy doing whatever they were doing. And so she stayed in the spare room and he, but I mean, I think... My dad wasn't a very nice guy. He was kind of, he might have been a nice guy. I shouldn't say that. He wasn't nice to people when he talked to them. Hmm. He didn't really portray portray how he felt about people by how he talked to them. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't, didn't talk very nice to my mom. And it was, it, I would say that probably was the main issue between them was how just mean he was all the time. Mm -hmm. Was it just one way or would, would they bicker? Oh, no. No, no, she was very passive aggressive. She would. Okay. I mean, I don't even know about the passive aggressive. She just, well, it must have been because she didn't argue back. So I'm sure she let her feelings know, be known. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she let that be known. But they lived in, so I didn't really move home except for just a couple months after college. So after, so I was 17 when I went to, away to college. Jer was in college and living at home, but his dad by then had passed. So that was in Ohio. And so I had only come back for a couple months. Five kids in a three bedroom house just doesn't work. So I definitely found my own way. And, you know, I worked for a year in Chicago and then for actually moved to Ann Arbor. So I, you know, got out of the house pretty much and did my thing. But when I was there, they were in the same bed when I was, when we were all growing up and you know, when I was still there. And then that separation of the bedrooms, I think, happened when they moved to Florida. So they moved to Florida in 1976 when I, the year I got divorced. Yeah. They moved to Florida and graduate. My mother graduated nursing school. My sister graduated high school and they all moved down there and I stayed up here. So they, they seemed to be pretty, you know, they had a good time. They had this thing about cruises. They they went on 19 cruises, which we we hate cruises. Yeah, we don't really like them we're too like much. The only I thought we were the only couple in the world that hated them. I mean, I, I there's a couple that we I would I told him the other day I would go on like Alaska. I would mm -hmm. do that or some a couple of other exotic ones, but no, not just for yeah. I'd like to see a real jazz cruise. That would be good. But, you know, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, but they loved it. They would go on two or three a year. They adored it. And they did it th with all the other nurses from the hospital that my mom worked with. So I think they totally partied down. I mean, they, that was, <laughs> they, so I think they got along pretty well, even though he did have his crouchy moments. Was that more later in life? I think he actually. That they get along better? Um, they, they concentrated a lot on work and getting through and surviving mm -hmm. when he was, when we were all young. Yeah. You know, he worked hard and he sold cars. That's how he supported us. He sold cars. And then somehow they thought they were going to pay for all of our colleges. And I actually, as the oldest, I, I said, okay, that's crazy. There's no way you guys can pay for college for all of us. Maybe a semester each and that's it. And I wouldn't let them, you know. <laughs> so, no, they they were they were just doing what they had to do to survive. And my dad... His, was it from Polish stock? His, my grandmother was from Poland. They, he was one of what, 13 kids. And so his idea of relaxing, it wasn't relaxing. He was, he didn't know relax much. Mm -hmm. He would watch TV, watch a game on TV, but he'd be out fixing a car or building something or repairing something or making something. And that was, you know, that was his idea of a good time in a way. And, you know, there, there was more dysfunction really between my dad, well, there's that. I think he was in pain a lot in later years, and that's why he talked like he did to my mom, because 
he was hurting. And so, you know, it comes through in the voice, it comes through in your attitude and stuff. But I think that the, the larger dysfunction was between how my dad treated the kids, the children, the five of us, mm -hmm. and his inability to deal with the chaos that's in, that was in our house, five kids. I mean, tiny little house. And so his solution, of course, is besides doing whatever he did to discipline us, which was like hit us and that kind of thing, he also would build onto the house. And so it just <laughs> kept growing because it's like, I can't take it. But I think he had PTSD. He was in World War II. Yeah. And I believe he had a classic undiagnosed case. Mm -hmm. So it healed over time. It did heal. He, he finally, when he was quite like in his 80s, he talked about his experiences with a newspaper reporter and with, you know, but up until then, he, it was very hard for him. And I think it was all, he could not handle the five of us. And so he would just strike out, literally mm -hmm. strike out. Well, <clears throat> what would you say have been some of the pivotal moments or challenges that you guys have faced in your relationship together? What do you think? Well, I think one of the big challenges, I mean, our main bone of contention is where we come from, not where, not locationally, but there's a thing that sources things. And I, you know, I, and I somehow I had a pretty dysfunctional childhood. Somehow I came out of it stronger. Jer came out of what was actually a probably better functioning small family, but he had this fear and I'm speaking for you, but okay. there was this fear that he's one step away from the poorhouse. This is a successful orthodontist, and he's one step away from the poorhouse. And I'm believing that there's going to always be hope, always be more. We'll work hard. We'll do what it takes. And this poor guy, just there, that's the, the default. And so we always, we've, we've had a lot of, we used to have a lot of conflict over that. And I think, I think that I have tried as well as my bachelor's degree was in so social sociology so and I'm trying to understand where does this come from and why and I think that over time I've learned what creates that conflict we're not very different after all it's just that he responds in a fear and I respond in a different way mm -hmm. and those things don't necessarily so that that was a turning point we we discovered that the first 3 years were a little tough well we didn't have a lot of money. We worked hard. We, it was really rough, mm -hmm. but it was pretty great too. That's great. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. I definitely, I'm, you know, again, you wonder where these things come, but, you know, dad died when I was 13. There was little, there was almost nothing left. There was no pension. Mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, maybe that same generation, because my, my mom, would be the same generation as Linda's parents. Mm -hmm. uh, had a phenomenal work ethic too, and went straight out to work, and you know worked really hard. But there was all there was cer certainly this enormous conversation about scarcity, and there was all because my sister has the same thing too. Mm -hmm. So um, this would be. Uh, you Is know, that cultural? Uh, cultural as well. It could be, you know. Um, I, I I love to say this, but W. B. Yeats, you know, has this great quote. He, he says about the Irish: they have an abiding sense of tragedy <laughs> that sustains them through temporary periods of joy. Wow. And that's <laughs> wow! That's, that, I, I love that. That, that, that summarizes so powerful. Jerry's <laughs> personality. When we heard yeah. that, we just said, "Oh, yep. okay." That now, now we know. Now we know exactly what makes him tick. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, when I look back at it when, uh, over the years in, in our relationship at the times when, you know, we'd be stressed out and we'd be kind of really going at each other would certainly be around uh, worries about finances or taxes or stuff like that. And she always w would take a more positive and, and I'd be, I would be fearful. Mm -hmm. I'd be much more So I think those are the things that we've, we've kind of done our best to continue to work through. And I think, I think we're, we're doing a lot better than we used to. Well, we'd have to, otherwise. <laughs> so, so I have a question that's very personal, and you can choose to share as much or as little as you'd like. But, you know, in, in working with couples over this long period of time since 2002, we've really noticed like this developmental stage of a, a couple's intimacy. Mm 
mm-hmm. and how it, it starts out one way. And then there's things that happen that are really, in my opinion, potentials for levels of growth and change and, and more connection. So you guys start out in your 30s. Mm-hmm. You're now in your 60s. So anything you'd like to share about what that journey has been like for you guys? I would say it's profoundly different mm-hmm. for me. I'll let Linda give her own comments on that. It's almost it's it's be almost beyond words actually. There are, I think if I look back, I, I can't these are more um rather than a particular moment over something over a period of time where there was suddenly I would look at her and what I was present to was the mystery that this is the woman I sleep beside every night. And I even after all of these years, there's a whole mystery there that I don't know anything about and it's it's incredible and it's and and it's god it's holy yeah you know sacred yeah it is and um so that's something that uh, that gets expressed in in our physicality with one another in 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 our sexual relationship and 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 that uh, and so that's a, a deeper and uh, and sacred thing that that is just were there were there any like aha moments where you got to another level <laughs> I'll have to have her answer that one for you. Um, but if I could just say just a little bit more before I let her, well, no, I, I'll turn it over. No, go, ahead. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish now. Um, finish. Fine. There, there's all the things that that maybe you know. Obviously, I I, I love her deeply, but I really like her, mm-hmm. and I like listening to her, and I like talking to her, and like hearing what she has to say, and. Again, if these are trite or whatever, I'm sorry. I mean, she doesn't let me ever be small. She basically insists that I be big and calls that out in me and also supports that in me and demonstrates it herself. So it's, this is not just something that she's there as a support. She lives that herself, you know, in, in the way she, she gets involved in various projects, the way she deals with people. You know, this is a very guy thing. I'm going to just say it. And if, it, if it's sexist, I apologize. But it's like she always makes me know that I'm her man. And that is so powerful for me because I'm actually really proud of it. That I am her man, you know, and um, I don't I don't see that as sexist you know, at all. Yeah. I don't, I don't okay. either. I don't okay. think yeah. I don't it's particularly a guy thing, but it's like I am proud to be her man. It's not the the. the you know, it's not a possession kind of thing, but I'm proud to walk with this woman who considers me to be her guy. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that has deepened over the years. And so, I mean, I trust her impeccably. Those are things that I think that do develop over the course of, 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 a, of a 30 year or plus relationship yeah. and, uh, and that they continue to deepen. So I don't know if that's answered, but that's my... It's great. It's great. I well, love that. I just got to say, I love that concept of mystery that you just... You brought up that that's so it's so descriptive, you know, and it just kind of resonated with me when you said that. Oh. So. You know that that concept of mystery. I don't know, Linda, if you feel the same way, but we're a mystery to ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we're always constantly changing, and stuff's coming up. And <laughs> Isn't that true. You know, <laughs> we just had something going on the other day, and he's like, "How would you like me to respond when you're like that?" I'm like, "I don't know. <laughs> Today it might be this, but tomorrow." Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right, right. And I think there is I something sacred, <laughs> yeah, in the differences of men and women. You know, yeah. and and that that feeling that you said about being her man mm-hmm. and i think that is what all human beings want mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. to be someone's person yeah yeah well, that's beautiful yeah what about for you lena wow well i don't know i never really thought much about it in those ways i mean jerry's those are things that jerry has said in the past but i you think you went through having a baby menopause <laughs> stuff has it changed over the years you know, it's interesting because there's so little artifice with this man that it never even occurred to me that there he would there would be a difference that he would be different. What's wonderful is regard he still somehow manages to make me feel like I'm attractive even though I'm 40 pounds overweight again. He still makes me feel like that. That's whatever that is, that should be in a bottle and sold. That's <laughs> an amazing, wonderful thing. And that is the basis for me that he sees that in me. You know, we've, we've, you know, there's different kinds of intimacy, you know, just in talking, you can get 
down and start talking about things. And one of the things that we've learned over the 30 years is, I mean, for me, it's been harder for me to open up and to get down to that level and be able to verbalize it. But so what I would end up doing is trying <laughs> getting to that point of maybe I can get to something. And one of the things, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so he, I would be just, I would some, some topic, I, I can't even think of it. A topic would come up and Jerry would say, you know, that reminds me of something that happened to me the other day. <laughs> and he'd be off on his own journey talking about it. And I'd be like, well, wait, wait, what about me? So that's something we've worked on. And I noticed actually in the last year, he's really tried to be not do that as much and let me actually talk and just talk about stuff and not be include not have him include himself into whatever I'm talking about and just listening. That's really good. 30 years though. 30 years of hard work. <laughs> I said that you're work. doing good though. You're doing so, very, so very two good. more questions. <laughs> One is, what advice would you have for young people? And I want you to think from the perspective before your first marriages. You know, Jerry, you had said that you knew. You knew it wasn't right. And you were looking for something that probably wasn't what you were supposed to be looking for. What advice would you have for people at that stage of life? Well, when you say that, I think of our 29-year-old daughter who um, is not in a marriage right now. She hasn't been married. She was living with somebody for like and together with somebody for four years, and we thought that he was the one. We all did, all four of us. And no, his parents too. Six of us thought that this was it. And so when they split up and she did it, it just wasn't, it, I guess it wasn't the right thing. So I'm, th I'm thinking of what would I say to her? What do I say to her? What do you look at, you know, how do I? She has seen, she's, she's heard a lot. She knows about our previous marriages. She knows a lot about our previous lives. But what advice would I give her is what I'm thinking when you say that. Mm -hmm. And I guess the thing I would say, which is kind of goes contrary to what I feel as a in talking to say my own daughter is don't be in a hurry. If this per if this is right, this person's going to be there tomorrow, despite the deadline he was giving me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be in a make, you know, let yourself unfold. Let let the relationship unfold. And you know, you'll know if it unfolds quick or slow. Look for the good guy. Don't look for the cutest guy. Look for the good person. Look for the good heart. Look to make sure he's your match in humor and in, in intellect. You want to find somebody that's maybe even smarter than you, if possible, right? But you want to have somebody that you can engage with because... Yes, this, you know, the chemistry is really important. And that chemistry is, is pretty rare. That's not what, that's not, at the end of the day, it's not the chemistry. It's not going to sustain you. Yeah. You know, it's not going to sustain you. The, what would you say? To have the courage. I think, I think the courage to know and when it's not right and to take the action. <laughs> yeah. And not wait till afterwards until it's later. If in your gut this is not the right one, that doesn't mean that they're not wonderful people, but if this is not the one that you want, that you feel at that time, and as Linda said, you really don't know, but if there's something that's not there or that you sense is not there, just have the courage to, to say this, we can't, we, we shouldn't really go on or we should take more time or mm -hmm. we should take a break or something and say that. Yeah. So how do you know your partner loves you? How do you know I love you? I didn't know I love you. I, I should kind of add a little bit because you've mm -hmm. asked this question differently in the past. Mm -hmm. it, what is it that your partner does that lets you know that they love you? Okay. Well, I mean, the, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is he comes home. He comes home and he comes home completely. He brings his entire self, be it a bad day self or happy or stimulated or but he brings himself home. Mm -hmm. There's nobody else he takes it to. And so that's, he, I mentioned this before, he finds me so attractive still and lets me know that that's where he'd rather be is with me. <laughs> We're laughing. <because> I'm <laughs> this is an aside. 
early on in the marriage, you know, we'd be watching TV or looking at magazines or something. He'd go, oh, whoever the 30 years ago, who's the attractive women that were 30 years ago? So he'd just be like Raquel Welch. I don't know, just lusting after somebody. And I finally said, honey, if you can get them to go to bed with you, you have a free pass. <laughs> well, you go for it. And then it's like, <laughs> I mean, because he's not going to do that. You know, he's not. Wow. I just, I, I just know. She, as I said, I think I said the best way I can tell you that I know she loves me is that I, I'm her man. And she lets me know that all the time. And, uh, and it's not, it's, I remember, whew, the reason I say that is remember if you guys ever remember is that I think uh, James Carville, the 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 Democratic, what was it commentator and mm -hmm. polo, and he was point married, counterpoint or something. Yeah, like that exactly. Was it yeah. Mary Matlin? No, his his wife is that the name she was? Mm -hmm. And these are like I went to high school with her. No way, yeah. really? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's cool. Yeah. But anyway, I remember them being on a on, on a panel sometime and they say, "How the hell do you guys make it work?" She's a Republican, a strong Republican strategist, and mm -hmm. here's and and you're on polar opposite sides of the, and um, you know, I, they didn't actually answer. But here's what I do remember: is that people were calling in and sending emails about how ugly James Carville was, and <laughs> calling him Skeletor. And I remember she turned over to she said, "You know what? You're my Skeletor, honey." <laughs> awesome. And I thought that was just really. And he was he was saying, "Hey, listen, I'm I'm walking, living example for any kind of ordinary guys that can have somebody like this marry him." You know, mm -hmm. so. I mean, I'm not saying it very well, but she sure as hell makes me feel that all the time. And I have no question about that, you know, so. You know, I, I will say this. We have always, well, no, I'm not going to say it that way. Jerry has found paths he's wanted to travel. Like, for example, these, he's discovered, he, for, during a while, he discovered this really great, great men's group out in the Southwest. And then he discovered the Southwest. So he but he discovered this fantastic men's group and it with with Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr, it's, it's it's phenomenal. And he did this men's rite of passage. The person who went out there and the person who came back were different. And what I so that's what I what I find that we get back way, way if we just get out of the way and let the person grow into who they really are becoming, that it pays us back. It pays, it's, I'm selfish when I let when I want you, ask you, go and do that thing every Monday. Go play downtown, because who comes back is bigger than who left. Mm -hmm. And that's that's. I mean, it's happened time and time again. And you're so supportive of me. Like he's just not even. It's expensive me taking these classes at Harper. It's time consuming. I should be home doing stuff. I've got all the responsibilities of the house. Like all the papers, the taxes, all that stuff falls on me, and I'm there throwing pots, and he's just completely in support of it. Yeah. Yeah, because the per the person you get back is alive. Yeah. And, and growing and expressing themselves in a way that's, that's, that's exciting to be around, and to see somebody who's enthusiastic about life or to live with that, I think that's really, just, I think it's really cool. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing is we... When it all comes to it, despite his fear of being in the poorhouse or being out on the street, a pauper, we have not skimped on our passions. So we we have, I don't want to, I cannot, I've tried to, ha tried to figure out how many thousands of dollars worth of musical instruments we have, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine, honey, but you know, like we've got to list them or something, tape, I don't know, we've got to do that for insurance anyway, but it's a massive amount and the stuff that I've done. So we are, we don't have so, you know, we don't drive these. I mean, we drive, okay, pretty nice cars, but we don't have all this stuff and we have maybe a little bit in the past, but it comes down mm -hmm. to where's, where's the priorities. And, you know, Jerry playing his saxophone or his piano or his keyboard or that's, I want to, I, you know, I, that's where I want to spend our money is in the lessons and the classes. And you wanna want to nurture that. I want him to, you know, I want him to yeah. grow to become that person that he's got in there. And then I, I agree with that. I, the same thing for her. 
and that there's this artistic side of herself that she's beginning to really nurture and express in a way that that brings her alive and that's what i get at home too so well both of you we really want to wholeheartedly thank you for coming on the podcast today this was such a joy and a pleasure for us you know we get wounded through relationship and we heal through relationship and we've been telling stories since the beginning of time to bond and to heal. And we hope that you guys sharing your story enriched your lives and the lives of our listeners. For all you listening, if you have any questions or topic suggestions, again, please feel free to leave a comment or look us up online at couplesynergy.com. Until next time. You have been listening to Couple Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. Couple Synergy was recorded edited and produced by Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. Voiceover and music entitled Breathe and Let Go was recorded and composed by Gina Gonzalez.